Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Michael Haig. He's founder of StoryMastery.com. He's one of the top story experts for Hollywood writers, filmmakers, studios, as well as public speakers, marketers, and business leaders. He's coached producers and stars for the past 35 years. You don't look that old. On such projects as I Am Legend, Hancock, The Karate Kid for Will Smith and Overbrook Entertainment, Masters of the Universe for Columbia Pictures, and he worked on projects for Julia Roberts, Morgan Friedman, and many more. Michael is the best-selling author of Selling Your Story in 60 Seconds, and the book, Writing Screenplays That Sell. And Michael, I have to tell you, when I heard about you, I immediately bought every book I can find on Audible, listened to it several times because stories that elicit emotion is really essential to everything we do in business and life, and you are an expert. So thank you so much for joining me. Oh, no, thank you for having me. I'm honored and excited about doing this. So, Michael, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask the question, what's the lowest point? in your life is and you had an interesting answer which brings up a question which is it's like i don't have any good stories for this one and so that makes me think because this does happen and what do i do when someone doesn't have a low point story or they feel like they haven't had a lot of adversity what do you what do you like if someone's writing like an email or they're telling their story they're a founder of a company and they're trying to kind of get the story out and they don't have that low point or adversity Uh, Well, first of all, I'd say there's a difference between a low point and adversity. A low point to me is just when you've thrown in the towel and everything seems like it's going against you. Mm -hmm. And there are stories like that. But if you if you think about, let's say, most movies, most movies are not about somebody who's at an absolute low point. It's just someone who is struggling with, is either in a static place, they're just sort of stuck, or they're struggling with one particular challenge. The adversity is simply the hurdles and obstacles they have to overcome in achieving whatever goal they decide to pursue. pursue. So um, I think that if, if I were coaching someone and they said that, they said, I don't have any, in fact, I had a client who said that just this week. They said, I don't really get this conflict thing because I've never been destitute and I've never been an alcoholic right. and I never was in a horrible accident and so on and so on. And I said, most of the characters in most stories aren't. I said, that's not what's important. What's important is what did you want to do and were there no obstacles? And I defy anybody, anybody to say they wanted something that was of real value to them and they had to, they were not, nothing stood between them and that goal. Because I just think if it, if it was that easy to get it, it probably really wasn't that important to them. The really, the really important things, the, the life-changing things elevate us or take us into a new place that challenges us at least internally and forces us to confront some fears. So that's the way to look at it. Forget the low point. Mm-hmm. And instead, where were you right before you decided you wanted to do this? Mm-hmm. Why did you want to do it? Something was not satisfying to you. You either Maybe you had a decent amount of money, but you wanted a lot of money. Maybe you had, you know, maybe... You, you were, had a happy marriage, but you wanted children or whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. So figure out first, again, if you're the hero of your own story, what's the goal you're going to tell us about? Tell me then or tell us then where were you right before you decided you were going to go after that? Wherever that was, it may not have been a low point in your life, but it was certainly a point in your life where you were unsatisfied about something. Mm-hmm. Or, or it was a point in your life where you thought everything was fine and then some opportunity was presented to you that you never dreamed of and you decided, wait, i got to go for that. All of a sudden, this wish has been presented to me. I've got a chance to travel around the world if I only do X, and that's what the story is about. Mm-hmm. So that's the way I would look at it is start with what you wanted and then say what stood between me and that. Mm-hmm. So maybe more unsatisfied than low point? Um, 
Yeah, and maybe it was my misinterpretation of the question, because when you said low point to me, I translated that to mean what that client of mine thought, destitute and just on the skid, you know, just everything had fallen apart. But maybe you didn't mean that by low point. Maybe you just mean you weren't as happy as you are now in some way. Right. So I, what I'm saying is either don't interpret it the way I did, or if you do, don't feel like that's a necessity to tell a good story. Right, right. Cause I, and, and the fact is, the reason I said I don't really have any good stories because I can't remember a time in my life when I hit bottom, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I, I've always been a pretty happy person. Actually, I've always been a very happy person, I believe. And so I've had struggles like everybody has and there have been challenges and there have been you know times of depression and times of of fear and worry but never not those not those movie of the week stories mm -hmm. you know, not, not those stories about people yeah. who i i lost everything and right. somehow came back right i guess it depends who you're comparing yourself to and i was just i just ask it not comparing yourself to anyone just your personal but yeah, if you compare yourself to like an alcoholic who's living in an alley, then you think, yeah, I haven't really had a low point, or you know. Yeah, and you hear though you hear those like Tony Robbins, who's just a fantastic speaker, uh, I think. Um, but he tells about he was very very poor when he grew up. He tells right. about people bringing and giving them food at Thanksgiving. Right. They couldn't yeah. afford food. Uh, we didn't. Nobody. Nobody did that for me, you know, and so I know there is a cachet to that. If you've had that kind of experience, of course, tell it. But don't decide I can't be a storyteller because I've never been destitute. That would be a mistake, I think. Yeah. yeah. Or, or the other thing you could do is just make it up. <laughs> tell people you were destitute even if you weren't. You think that's what it needs. What difference does it make, you know? All it, all it matters is that what but that what you're conveying to your audience is true. The facts don't have to be. So as long as you're not as long as you're not bilking them out of money or something, <laughs> make stuff up. So on the on the flip side of that, I've always wondered this, and I thought you'd be a good person to ask: is how do you get people to open up and be more vulnerable to fully share their story? Like if you have someone you're working with and you know there's a story there, but they're not fully telling it or being vulnerable about it? Is there a way that you bring that out in them? There's a way that there are ways that I try, but that's, that's a tough one because I, because really good stories do come from a place of vulnerability and you do have to get in touch. There's a question I ask fairly frequently of clients who are writing screenplays, uh, especially when I can't get quite a handle on what the story is really about on a deeper level, and I'll ask them, where are you in this story? And I say, I don't mean which character are you. I'm not saying you are the, you are the cop in the story or you are the teenage boy or whatever it is. I mean, where is, what is it in this story that's reflective of you, of your beliefs, of your fears, of what you're struggling with? Mm -hmm. And it's not an easy question to answer, but it is a question worth exploring mm -hmm. because if the client is willing to just play around in that sandbox for a while, then we can start to recognize that maybe there's a reason they're telling the story that they haven't really wanted to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. But it's only by figuring that out and being willing to kind of bear their soul within the story, that it's going to reach a level of artistry that I think it needs to or that they want it to. Uh, it's, it's very important, and it is something that I'm very aware of coaching people, but it is one of the tough things about writing and being a storyteller. And by the way, that doesn't, I, I use screenwriters as an example because, you know, I've had that experience a lot with them, but it's the same if you're a public speaker. I mean, if yeah. the, the hardest thing about public speaking is not fear of being on the stage. You think that's it, and at first that might be it. But the hardest thing about being a public speaker is standing every, in front of everybody and getting naked in a certain way, of really being yourself yeah. and sharing 
a pain that you have gone through or that you're still struggling with. It might mm. be more likely in your past that you've managed to get through, but that's hard. It's yeah. hard to step out of our emotional armor and really share our truth. But those are the those are the speeches and those are the stories that are right. most powerful. Yeah. And you know that and when you're coaching someone, how do you get them to like when you read, let's say they're doing a speech and you go, you're thinking they haven't really gotten naked in this. How do you is there a specific example, not that you have to name names, but how you got them to actually get on stage and do that? It's not quite like you're saying, it's not like, okay, come on, you gotta, you gotta be courageous, you gotta get up on stage and doing that. More than that, I think it's pointing out to them what the gaps are in the story or suggesting that what they're really getting at is something deeper. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I, I coached somebody just this week who, a new client who's a public speaker and wanted my feedback on a story. Now it wasn't that this person wasn't willing to share or say something about himself that was fairly raw, but it was more, but it was more asking those questions and getting at, but, but what really happened then? What were you really feeling? What really made you change? It's one of the things I say a lot, not a lot, but one of the things I say often to speakers is audiences don't don't just want to know that you changed. Okay, stories about heroes who change are fine, but if all you're going to say is, and then this character was courageous and they changed, that does me no good. I know I'm supposed to be more courageous. What we want to know is how. And so the key to the story is not that they that they had the moment of courage. It's what happened right before that. Mm -hmm. How did they find that courage? What was the new way of looking at the world? What was the new thought? What was the piece of wisdom or advice they were given? What was the realization they had that they finally realized that the pain of not doing something was worse than the, the than the anticipated pain of doing this scary thing, that's that's the kind of linchpin of the story when it comes to that transformative kind of story. So it's it's not about pushing a client that's going on the stage into doing something they don't want to do. It's more like let's see what's really going on in this story you tell. And and in my experience, most of the time when we finally get to what's really going on and they realize it they don't back out, then they, they want to share that, mm -hmm. and they want to be more open. Yeah. Yeah. It wouldn't always be, I mean, sometimes, and, and occasionally it's not, and then I think the issue is maybe it's not time to tell this story yet. Maybe it's still too raw. Mm -hmm. I don't think you want to process your problems on stage. I right. think you need to wait a little bit until you work something through, and then you can share it with somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think the stage is a <laughs> it's not the best therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it could be, but I don't think that's what the audience wants it to do. It's Pretty trial good. by fire. Um, <laughs> so on the flip side of the, the low moment, uh, what's been one of the proudest moments for you? Um, a moment that was totally my own at first was when I wrote my first book and the first copy arrived in the mail. Mm. Because that first book took me like five years to write. Uh, the way I usually put it, it was a, it was a five year journey. It was six months of writing and four and a half years of block. <laughs> Because it was so hard. I mean, my writer's block was so strong and I, it was just like getting, getting to the computer to do that and postponing and procrastinating and so on. And when I finally saw it in, not the galleys or any of that, this was the, the book that was going to be in bookstores. There was a moment of real, di very difficult to describe satisfaction that ran very deep. It was like, you know, you did this. And it's kind of this realization, no matter what else happens, or if nothing else happens in your life, you did this. And that meant a lot to me. That meant a lot to me. And then it's not 
maybe it's not quite as proud, but there's also a very exciting moment that follows that. And that's the first time you see your book in a bookstore that you're not there doing a signing, but you just, you know, I would randomly go in a bookstore in Detroit because I was lecturing there and there'd be my book. And that was sort of cool. But the, but the moment of real pride was when I, I finished that and, and got to see the first copy. Was that writing screenplays that sell? No, that... Screenplays that sell. Yeah. And this is this is is this about the twentieth anniversary of the book? Yeah, it's, it's actually gone. The I did a new edition. The Harper Collins wanted me to do mm-hmm. a new edition when it was a twentieth anniversary. So I updated everything and used all new example, well, a lot of new examples and updated things and a few things that I had a different perspective on than I had twenty years ago. But it's been now almost. Maybe it has been 25, I think, since mm-hmm. it was actually published. And it's still, I, I still, uh, I still really am pleased with that book. It's still, even though, you know, movies have changed in a lot of ways in terms of the of the industry. You know, there's all the new cable, and the, I mean, when I first wrote that book, there was no such thing as the internet, and there was no such you know, all that. That's wild to think about. Yeah, I, I wrote that book. I wrote, I, I think I actually wrote that book on a computer, but it was like a K Pro is the first computer I ever had, you know, one of these little things that had about, you know, one kilobyte. Right. Of right. Like that. But anyway, all that's changed. But when it comes to Hollywood storytelling, it hasn't really changed much at all. In fact, I don't know that it's changed at all. The only differences would be in the way I looked at things and maybe making them a little clearer, more simple for people who want to break in. Yeah. But uh, otherwise, so I'm still very, very happy with that. Yeah. So is the new one going to be on Audible? Is the new one, the new version, uh, writing screenplays that sell the new edition? Uh, not that. Uh, not that. <laughs> do you know something I don't know? No, no, no nobody's ever said anything about that. No. Um, I think that, and I've never pushed it because I do have a lot of material that people can listen to. That's yeah. on like Heroes Two Journeys. That's more recent thinking than is in that mm-hmm. book, and so on. I, I do have, uh, although. It may end up being another five years, but uh, there is uh, another book that I want to be writing. Which and, is are you allowed to talk about? Well, oh. well I, I, that book does not include either my. It doesn't include the things that are in the Heroes Two Journeys, the lecture, the DVD, and the CD, and mm-hmm. the. It, that's now you can video stream that as well, mm-hmm. the Heroes Two Journeys, but that's not in book form, and and nor. Mm, I got gotcha. you. What I would, what my next book needs to be is about that six stage structure and especially the things about the inner journey, what we've been talking about in terms of identity and essence and transformative material. And I would want the new book to be broader in its scope in that when I give these principles, it's not just for screenwriters, but it would apply, it would, I mean, it applies to everyone, but it's really was designed for screenwriters. And so someone who's a storyteller on stage, they can extract helpful material, but yeah. it, but nothing speaks directly to that. Yeah. The next book I write is going to be, this is how stories work. And if you're in this situation, it applies this way. And if you're a marketer, it's this way. And if you're an attorney, it's this way. And so on. Yeah. Yeah, so Michael, I've, this has been fantastic. I have one last question. Thank you so much. Before I mm-hmm. ask it, tell people where they should check out more uh, from you. What are you working on lately? Okay, well, the uh, the the main places go to my website because you'll hear you'll see more about me than you ever wanted to know. But mostly, there's just an abundance of articles I've written and questions and answers. And there are some short tips, things I call misdemeanors, which are the things you shouldn't do when you're writing a script or telling a story and so on. And then also, anyone who's interested in working with me on their story as a consultant or for me to coach them on their story, whether it's a story for a speech or a presentation in a corporate arena, or it's a written story, or anyone who's listening and wants to be a screenwriter is a screenwriter. If you go to the website, it 
tells all about my coaching process and you can sign up there and it has all of the products we've talked about the books and 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 so on and the website is storymastery.com yeah we'll link that up yeah that would be great i'd appreciate yeah. that but it's but apart from the coaching and the the uh, products the things you pay money for i just want it to be a real good resource and there is an abundance well you abundance. know abundance oh yeah out in there and there's there's a lot of articles about different aspects of storytelling uh you know and and reference to movies and at the very least if nothing else i think it'll change the way you look at movies yeah it for sure will yeah, yeah. that that's uh, you said what's one of the one of the things i always enjoy as much as anything when i lecture to groups um novelists screenwriters whatever is when people come up and say to me i'll never look at movies the same way again it always kind of excites me it's like that's cool because they don't they aren't mad it's like i never thought about this and i can appreciate that more and to me it's it's kind of like that is more than anything being close to what that kid i was talking about who was five years old in the movie theater it's like i'm now i'm now directly connecting a movie goer with what I love in a way that they can get more involved. And, yeah. and that's just cool to me. That's yeah. just, uh, that's, that's kind of, I think in a way what I dreamed of way back then when it wasn't even formulated as a full dream. Yeah. So my last question, Michael is just, you know, we've talked a lot. What's something we should leave people with to close on? I, I don't know. Picnic basket. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's a, that's a, what should we leave? Any, any final words, any things that, you know, we talked a lot about different things, any final kind of something well, that people see, should. Some things we've touched, I mean, we've talked about when you tell a story, focus on character, desire, and conflict. And we talked about um, getting that. I'll, I'll, let's see. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say one last thing. I, I often say this when I'm lecturing. And that is, when you think about it, almost everything I've talked about in terms of story is true for real life. And when we were talking about identity, one of the ways, identity being the emotional armor, the persona, if you like the Jungian term for it, you know, that that false self we present to the world. And if you're watching a movie and you want to figure out what is a character's real inner conflict, then ask yourself, how would this character fill in the blank in this sentence? Okay, and the sentence is, I'll do whatever it takes to achieve my goal. Just don't ask me to blank, because that's just not me. So for Will Hunting, who we talked about with Good Will Hunting, he'll do whatever it takes to win the love of Skylar, the mini driver character. Just don't ask me to let anyone in and see who I truly am because that's just not me, okay? So what I leave people with is one of the most powerful things you can do is ask yourself how would you fill in that blank? So think about first what's your goal. Get very specific of what your next thing, what your next finish line you want to cross in your career, in your personal life or whatever it is. So you really know this is what I want and then say, Just write it out. I'll do whatever it takes to achieve that goal. Just don't ask me to blank because that's just not me. And whatever you put in the blank that isn't you is the thing that scares you. And then you just ask yourself, what is the smallest step I could take toward doing that thing? And then keep asking, what's the next step, next step? Because that's the thing that is most standing in the way of you getting that thing that you want. And that's the thing that if you confront it, you can really transform. Yeah. Michael, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, me too. Me too. Those were great questions. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, you too. All right. There. Bye-bye.